Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick Gumowitz, the Engelson Family Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, Sally Menard and Norton Garfinkel, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. In the midst of this rollicking roller coaster of a political season that we've analyzed here on this program, sometimes you've got to turn to Pandora, iTunes, a CD, radio, FM, or whatever is your preferred easy listening application, and just sit back and relax. One of the go-to stations for me is German-American, Spanish-inspired guitarist Otmar Liebert. Indeed, we increasingly find ourselves in need of an infusion of meditative calm, and our guest today embodies that in his own musical genius. Ordained as a Zen monk, Liebert made the voyage from his artistic refuge in Santa Fe, New Mexico, to the Highline Ballroom, and now to our studios here in New York City. The newest album from the Grammy-nominated musician and his band Luna Negra is Waiting in Swan, featuring, of course, flamenco guitar. The album counts several Bob Marley covers, as well as reggae mixes of his classic Barcelona Nights. And as with our musician guests of past, Aloe Black and Moby among them, will discuss Liebert's craft, the promise of music to bond us, to heal us, and to rejuvenate our collective human spirit. Mm. Admar, thanks for being here. No, well, thank you. Thanks for having me. It was really a pleasure to hear you the other night. And the focus, the Zen-like focus that you exhibit, is an inspiring call to calm, to think. I think it's just really that I'm not a good showman. <laughs> <laughs> the anti-Trump, if you will. Um, but no, I, I found myself, and I see in, in your performances, you tend to close your eyes. Mm -hmm. What are you thinking or not thinking in that moment? I'm not really thinking, I'm just um, working with the music. And people have asked me, why, why don't you say more, or why do, you know, why do you not have singers, or why don't you sing? Um, and I think it's because um, if, I, if I would have words for what I'm doing, I, you know, I could write, um, but, but I really don't. It's a, it's a whole different thing, and I, I think um, it, it, it's, it's one of the beauty of, of instrumental music is that... Um, it can be background, it can be what I mean, people call easy listening, but it's really one of those things where it's, it's as much as you're willing to give it. It's sort of like reading a book. If you read about a tree and there's a description, you have to grow that tree in your mind. That's not on the page, there's just words there. So that's an active uh, way of looking at media, whereas a movie or TV would be passive because they're showing you the tree. Um, in the same way, when somebody sings a song for you, those words get so much in the foreground that even if they're using minor keys, and musicians have, this, have done this many times, where you, you take a minor key, uh, key music and then put like happy lyrics to it, and people think it's a happy song. So um, in a song, you're told what to feel, whereas in an instrumental music, you get as much out of it as you're willing to put into it. It's sort of like reading a book. It's you have to like use your imagination and see what something is about. It seems to me it's mind absorbing mm -hmm. in that application, but also mind relaxing. Sure. The mind loves to see patterns, right? I mean, we've all done this. You, you put on TV, you turn the sound off, you put a Pink Floyd record on. It always makes sense, right? And I think our mind loves to, you know, figure out what's going on. That's what it does best. 
So yeah, I think in that sense it is relaxing because that's what the mind likes to do. How did you discover guitar? Um, there was a show in Germany called Beat Club, and you can probably find snippets of it on YouTube. Um, and they had a lot of bands playing live. Um, and I had this master plan at 11 years old. I wanted to play electric guitar, um, but I knew we lived in a small apartment. There was no way that was going to happen. So um, I told my parents I wanted a classical guitar and I wanted to start studying classical guitar. Um, so then a few years later, I think around 16 or so, I started playing electric. Um, but that was my, my plan as an 11 year old. I, I thought I was so crafty. How do you define your approach? Well, actually when I came to the States, I still wanted to be an electric guitar player. I actually um, played in Boston for like six years or so, all uh, in electric bands, played in New York clubs a few times, but um, moved to Santa Fe uh, in 86 and just decided that um, nylon string guitar is really what I wanted to do um, and that really you know uh, changed my life totally as well um, especially since I fell in love with the city and uh, Santa Fe is one of those really unusual places that is such a an interesting mix of culture um, there's a lot of you know from restaurants to music there's a lot of cross-cultural stuff I remember one of the first groups I saw playing there, you know, in the back of a restaurant was a banjo player, a classical violinist and a flamenco guitarist. And I thought to myself, what, you know, this is great. <laughs> How weird and strange and wonderful. The melting pot of guitar. Yeah, yeah. You and I were talking off camera. Mm -hmm. The land of enchantment is very dear to my heart. Mm -hmm. If I could live one place other than this city, mm -hmm. it, would, it would probably be in your quarters, Santa Fe mm -hmm. or Albuquerque. Mm -hmm. You don't um, want to live <laughs> why, why not? <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I like performing there. There's a lot of great people there. But I go to Albuquerque basically to fly somewhere. Um, and other than that, Santa Fe for me has everything I need. But there's something in the temperament, in the water, in the kind of desert mm, yeah, of for sure. New Mexico that is distinctive and that to me in the way that I've been listening to your work for a decade plus now, more than that, um, it resonated that I feel enchanted listening to the music. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. And, and it, to me, it just made kind of parallel sense in this universe that here's Atmar who found his home in New Mexico. What is it like to live in New Mexico? Well, I think the first shaka was... Um, first time I've always lived in cities um, and the first time I, I, I climbed on a mountain in, in, in Santa Fe and I was able to look for what was probably 50 miles you could see the outskirts of Albuquerque um, it was just shocking it just seemed like here's a canvas how are you gonna live in this canvas this emptiness this space um, and I think it was for me just incredibly inspiring you know, it was sort of like a reset button. What, what do you really want to do? Um, and by the time, you know, I got signed, I would say I got signed really late. I was already 30 um, by a record label. Um, I actually loved my life in New Mexico, in Santa Fe so much that um, I was able to say no to some of the demands they were making just because in the end I was like, I can stay there, I'm, I'm fine, I don't have to have this deal. Because they wanted me to move to L.A., that was one of the prerequisites. I, they said, you have to change your name, nobody's going to like want to deal with Otmar Liebert. Uh, and I was so happy living in Santa Fe that I actually said, you know what, then I'll walk, you know. I always ask artists here, whether it's Macy Gray or Moby, mm -hmm. what is the feedback now at this contemporary moment from uh, folks who listen to your music? Um, well, because it's instrumental, you really get feedback from all over the world. Um, you know, people from Iran, Iraq, uh, to all places in Europe, Australia, um, Asia. Um, it's really all, all over the map. Um, 
you know, and I think what speaks to a lot of the people is that especially what I'm doing with, with the music is such a mix of different cultures. Um, and it seems like today there is such a fear of anything other, anything different. Um, and yet, um, the American, if you just look at the American table, what we eat, this food comes from all over the world. Um, it's not just, you know, English food or German food. Um, we have incorporated all sorts of stuff from um, Mediterranean, from the Middle East, from, from Asia, uh, Chinese. It's how, it's how you grow the fastest by get, get, getting, you know, adopting ideas and technologies from other cultures. And that has been proven in history time and time again, whether you go back to the ancient Persians or the Romans or the Ottomans. It's how a culture grows by incorporating other ideas and going, wow, how, they, how do they do this? Oh, I bet you this works with this, and then you can improve it again. Um, so I think any culture that sort of says, no, 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 it's just us, nobody gets in anymore, um, it's the beginning of atrophy, um, and the, the rest of the world will just pass you. you know, well, I hope that you would share with our listeners mm -hmm. that universal language that I've come to love. Mm -hmm. um, do you mind right. showing? Thank you, Atmar. Oh, you're welcome. And I wanted to tell our listeners a little bit more. You sure. do several Bob Marley covers in right. this latest album. What led you to... Well, there is a group of flamenco rhythms that's called tangos flamenco, and it has nothing to do with tango, which is Argentinian. Tangos is, um, what do you call the words that sound like a physical sound? Like tangos is supposed to be the sound of a drum. Um, and in fact, I think there's areas in South America was where that's still used for drumming and dancing. Um, so tangos flamenco is tangos and, and, and rumba and, and, and a number of other rhythms, but especially the one that's called tangos um, always seemed to me to be connected to reggae without even doing much, much research. You know, if you, a tangos rhythm would be, this is the one. Right? So there's nothing on the one, and it has a little bit of a lilt to it. And then one night, um, I searched the internet, as one does, and I discovered one guy that wrote about how um, tangos was brought from the Caribbean by sailors to the harbor in Spain. And then somehow the rhythm traveled down to Andalusia and was incorporated into flamenco. And so, in fact, since it came from the Caribbean, it's a, it's a sister, a sibling of, of reggae, as is salsa. They all avoid the one, uh, the first beat. Um, and, of course, the, you know, the, the parent of all these rhythms is probably somewhere in Africa, and I'm trying to find somebody that knows enough about rhythms and musicology in Africa to tell me, you know, what can we still recognize that rhythm? Is that still there? What does it sound like now? But what I wanted to do is, um, on this record, I did uh, 
stuff where the guitar, one guitar might play the tangos rhythm, the other one might play a reggae rhythm, and um, the cajon, which is the drum box, would play the tangos rhythm, and the drum kit would play the reggae rhythm, and it just works, you know. And at first I was like, you know, should we write some reggae songs? And then I kept asking people, and you know, everybody loves Bob Marley. There's not a single person that doesn't say, oh, that's that one's my favorite. So I ended up asking my friends uh, what their favorite songs were, and a lot of those we recorded. I, I was recently listening to the album, and I mm -hmm. thought to myself, well, if all of these foreign fighters could just pause for a moment, have some kind of epiphany, would that be possible? Because I think what is elicited through this kind of music can be transformational. Oh, sure. Well, to me, it's, it's always been... Uh, a sort of fun chuckle um, you know I can play in places and I know most of the, the my audience is really conservative depending on where I am and I'm, I don't want to get into places or anything but they're listening to Arabic music because that's what flamenco is you know uh, I when I play I, I, I made a record and played quite a bit with a, a friend of mine um, from Iraq and every time I played something that's more traditional flamenco, he always sort of looks at me from the side and said, you know that's an Arabic rhythm, right? So, you know, flamenco is Arabic music and rhythms filtered through centuries of gypsies making music. Uh, the gypsies themselves came originally from India, and then there's the Caribbean influences. So this, first of all, this whole idea that there is any such thing in music that's purity is bunk. It just doesn't exist. And second of all, I love that I'm playing these rhythms to people, uh, and, and the next time they hear something that's maybe a little more exotic, I have created a little bridge, and they're going, oh, this actually sounds really cool. It reminds me a little bit of that, but it's something different. When you think of Arabic groove, mm -hmm. right, in the traditional sense, do you see an increasing palatability, if you will, for and in, in, in a kind of immersion into this kind of uh, melting pot of contemporary music? Oh, sure. Music? That's been done for decades now. I mean, um, you've got um, Cheb Khaled, um, who's, uh, the, the music's called Rai. It's the pop music of Algeria. A lot of these guys live in, live in France and make, great songs or you know do you remember the the song desert rose that sting had um so i mean there's a lot of really great um algerian musicians and when you watch videos you go oh my god these guys can funk like anybody you know um what do you think atmar of the idea of musical activism or activist music as a vehicle to reconcile what are very deeply harbored animosities that still oh, sure. plague us. Um, I have, I, I know a lot of musicians that do things and they're more vocal about stuff. Um, I prefer to just sort of sneak in there. And I think I can do that best by making the music that I do that just sort of sneaks and um, and prepare somebody or, you know, just by them going, you know, I, I actually like this. It might prepare a seed for um, accepting something that's different uh, more than they would if they didn't hear it. I, I like, I like that, um, that it's, it's hidden in that sense. You know, you can just enjoy this music um, or you can get into it and try to find out what's behind it and all these different connections that are being made, like to the Caribbean on that, um, or Arabic music on some of the other records. Have you ever felt with an audience, and you say some of your listeners are conservative, that there is a risk inherent in um, where you choose to perform? Are you always at your maximum comfort, or do you sometimes find yourself in, in more um, questioning the climate in which you're playing, if it's consistent with your own moral yeah. compass, because yeah, I, I think it's a very it's a very good question because I, I I know that um, let's say hypothetically, and this has happened, but hypothetically that somebody asked me to play and I didn't agree with his, his political agenda. Um, I would still play for him, but then I might choose afterwards to give 
some of that money to a cause that I find right. Because I think music is something that needs to be universal. It's one of the glues that keeps us together. Um, and I would never um, ask people their opinion or their, their social or political leanings if they come to a show. So I also wouldn't ask it if somebody hires me. But I, you this know, is a subject that has created controversy to date about the use of political campaigns, oh, sure. uh, music right. when they're at ca rallies, and some have been explicit in demanding that. Oh yeah, the the candidate not play. Well, that's a whole other level. So what I is mean, that? How do you feel about that level? I, I your music. First. Not that anyone at a Trump rally would want to chill to your music. I, I, it's never come up. <laughs> But if, if it were, um, I think at that point, you're really being associated with a political opinion. Um, and at the very least, uh, you'd want to be asked about it. And that's one of the things that I find most upsetting is that they just feel like it's okay uh, to take it. And then, you know, you know, the artist has to find out, whoa, I didn't, I didn't okay that um, because the, you know, if you use music for a political rally, it does need to be licensed. So, and that um, seems in keeping with your philosophy. Yeah, I mean it, that's different from from um, from me playing for somebody who, who who I may not agree with. I mean, there's tons of people I don't agree with, um, but that's different from somebody making a message and playing my music to their message the introduction of new music is more and more difficult in the commercial mindset. Oh, sure. And you said you sneak in. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't want you to sneak out. How do you stay in well, when I, you sneak in? I'm really lucky. Um, when my first album was released in 1990, radio was still willing to take a chance. Um, and you could see throughout the 90s as um, stations be became, the valuation of, of uh, radio stations changed and so their value went up tremendously. Um, and as soon as you're dealing with huge amounts of debt when a radio station is bought, then you're also dealing with uh, accountants that go, prove to me that the people like this song as soon as you have that, then you've got companies coming in saying, we played this for an audience at a mall and they liked it. Now, you know, it's the same thing that happened to Hollywood movies. Do you want a director to create a movie or do you want the director then to be questioned for about every scene by an audience that, you know, is found at a mall? Nothing against people in malls, but when I go to a mall and I have to buy something, I get in and out. And somebody asks me, can you, you know, spend an hour looking at something? I'm like, are you kidding? I'm going home. So, um, you know, the moment you're, you're, you're wondering, well, will this work? Then suddenly the musical director has no power anymore. Right. And uh, I remember one of the first guys that played us a lot, program director from San Francisco, I think, um, Within two weeks of his station being sold, he saw the writing on the wall and jumped out of a six-story window. So um, in the 90s, that changed a lot. So I think if, if I came up and I did my music now, I'm not sure how much radio play I would get. And in the age of Pandora and iTunes? Pandora doesn't pay us anything. Pandora is like the worst way to listen to music. Shame on me. Apple Apple Music is great. Um, they they get their licenses. They they. Um, so they, how how does Pandora have the licensing rights to? Well, remember? as you if you followed some of the stuff about Spotify, mm -hmm. David Lowry, um, Spotify goes in and plays the stuff and worries about the licensing later. Right. Uh, and for a lot of stuff, they have never bothered to get the license. So instead of saying, you know, we won't play it unless right. you tell us where to get the license, they just play it all and then you have to go, but wait, wait, wait. Um, the artist is much more of a striving artist today than ever before in light of the digital age. Oh yeah, I'm sure. And so how do you, you, you clearly possess the perpetual creative instinct in wanting to develop 
album after album after album, all of which I've listened to. Well, in the, the end, albums too. What I really had to do is is just be really clear that I'm making albums for myself. I cannot count on anybody wanting to listen. And in a way, it, it has actually freed me because it's just like, what do I want to hear? I don't care. I, I don't know. I, I'm not going to tailor it to anybody else because this, in the, the, this, these days you don't know. Um, and you're not making money of it anyway since, you know, record sales have plummeted, you know, it's it's probably five percent of what it used to be in the 90s or or less so i'm not making money from the record i might as well make what i want to do i mean just you know my next album for example um i'm i'm about maybe two-thirds or three-quarters done with it and i just decided i want to do something there's so many notifications and alarms going off all the time everything is so fast i want to do a whole album that's slow slow music and I want to do everything just with a guitar. No band, nobody else, just me. And the only thing I allowed myself to do is things like slowing the computer down so I have half speed, which give, lets me play lower notes, longer notes, because they're, they're being played back at half speed. Uh, and I'm multi-tracking some guitars. Um, but I think it's, it's all going to be really slow stuff, because that's what I want to play with and since in, in a way you know yes it's horrible how little money we make from records because it, it means unless you're touring you're really not making any money um, but in, in this sense I you know I try to look at the positive side I get to do whatever I want because I can't count on it make, selling anything anyway well it's an amazing feat to accomplish that editorial integrity and autonomy. <laughs> I congratulate you on that, yeah, not just you. this latest album, uh, but a career dedicated to that same sense of purpose and craft, um, and will welcome your meditation and the imposition of that meditation upon a uh, tortured uh, ADD, <laughs> uh -huh. ADD infested reality. Right. Slow down. Yeah. Thank you, Otmar. Thank you very much. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time for a thoughtful excursion into the world of ideas. Until then, keep an open mind. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash open mind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick Gumowitz, the Engelson Family Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, Sally Menard and Norton Garfinkel, with special thanks to the Schumann Media Center for additional support, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.